So today's topic is complication of otitis media. Now, otitis media, there are different forms of otitis media. Among them is acute suppurative otitis media and chronic suppurative otitis media. Okay. So um, to begin with, it is divided into intracranial and extracranial complications. Okay. Now, in extracranial complication, it can again be divided into intratemporal. That means that occurs inside the temporal bone, and extratemporal means uh, that occurs outside the temporal bone. Okay, so uh, briefly, it is intracranial and extracranial. In extracranial, in uh, temporal and extratemporal. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so um, in intratemporal, it can again be divided into middle ear, mastoid, and inner ear. Okay, in middle ear, what can be the complication of otitis media? Perforation of tympanic membrane, ossicular lesion, facial nerve paralysis in mastoid bone itself, coalescent mastoiditis, reduced pneumatization of petro or petrocytis, and in inner ear, it is labyrinthitis and sensor neural hearing loss, okay? Now, in extratemporal, uh, again, extra, uh, if we do not see the intracranial one, that will be basal's abscess, diagrammatic abscess, post-auricular abscess, and other developmental problem. Now, how does the spread of the disease occur? Um, <clears throat> it can occur due to bone erosion, thromboflebitis, through normal anatomical pathways, through non-anatomical bony defects caused by trauma, which can be due to accidental or surgical or by neoplastic erosion of the bone. And through other surgical defects, like uh, in cases of post-stepidectomy that is done for otosclerosis. You will slowly get to get used to all the terms that is been in the slide, okay? Um, <clears throat> and um, into the brain tissue along the periarticular space by the um, space of virtual robin, okay? <clears throat> uh, see, in this picture, what we can see is there are different pathways of is meninges okay this is the um, different layers of um, this is actually the space between meninges and the bone okay now you can see preformed pathways that can uh, be seen as a um, way, pathway for spread into the intracranial region. Okay, now in this one, there is erosion of bone by granulation tissue that is mainly seen in case of chronic otitis media. Now, this is the Havishian canal that is the vessel that is connecting into the um, um, intracranial cavity that is connected here into the mastoid bone. Okay, now factors influencing the development of complication patient um, patient factor like age that is usually is common in the um, elderly and early age that is in children and immune status poor immunity is one of the factors that helps in harboring the disease and intercurrent chronic, chronic disease mainly it is about cholesteatoma okay uh, all of you know about cholesteatoma by now, I think, okay? Now, bacterial attributes, that means high virulence of the organism and how the uh, acute or uh, the chronic infection has been treated when there is active infection. So, sensitivity to the antibiotics, that is also very important. Now, another is anatomical pathways and spread. Anatomy can be like we have talked before, suture lines that is there in between the bones. Another one is um, um, this thing uh, through uh, this in uh, there is a from stapes bone there is a connection from um, middle ear to the inner ear. Here, right, so these are the preformed parts from where the middle ear infection can go into the inner ear. Now, uh, drainage of pneumatic spaces like natural or surgical. Natural means pneumatic spaces, it is mainly about the pneumatization. Now, efficacy of treatment of underlying middle ear disease. So, <clears throat> Um, that means when there is a chronic otitis media, and if there is a cholesteatoma, and if you if the disease is very active and you are uh, the intervention is um, delayed, then it can spread from middle ear cavity to the 
other species. Now, what are the general principles of management? Systemic antibiotic therapy, local neurosurgical attention to the complication identified, like for uh, intracranial complication and treatment of the ear lesion. <clears throat> Common symptoms of impending intracranial complications are persistence of otorrhea, pain, high-grade fever, altered sensorineum, toxemia, photophobia, and irritability. Next, stiffness and general, generalized management. So these are the signs for intracranial complications. Okay. So what are the principles of surgery when you see the complication? First is to eradicate the disease. Okay, and then establishment of the adequate drainage for the accumulated material. Now, how do you treat the case of tympanic membrane perforation? It is <clears throat> if it is due to chronic otitis media and there is a perforation, but there is no cholesteatoma, then simply you can do myeloplasty or tympanoplasty. Okay. Otherwise, some of the small perforations heals by itself. Okay. But if the perforation has uh, altered the hearing status, then you have to do the tympanoplasty. Okay. <clears throat> tympanoplasty means uh, doing repair of the tympanic membrane as well as to identify the ossicular status of the middle ear uh, structure and then to repair the um, ossicular defect. Now, one of the most important um, complication is um, acute mastoiditis. So uh, as as you know, mastoid antrum, mastoid antrum, and there are different other air cells around the middle ear. Among them, mastoid antrum is the biggest one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when there's an infection in the middle ear, the uh, occurrence of acute mastoiditis is the commonest symptom um, complication among the intratemporal complication. Okay, now uh, <clears throat> it can occur. Um, <clears throat> it can occur uh, along with acute suppurative otitis media, or uh, following chronic suppurative otitis media. Okay, now um, what are the organisms that are involved in chronic um, in acute mastoiditis? The common commonly um, the organisms uh, that occurs. Uh, that uh, in, gets involved in otitis media in both acute and chronic is in most of the time in acute it is streptococcus and staphylococcus whereas in chronic otitis media it is most of the time it is um, pseudomonas okay now uh, <clears throat> mainly pneumococcus and beta hemolytic st uh, streptococcus in most of the acute otitis media and anaerobes and mycobacterium tuberculosis are also one of the uh, factors that is seen um, in chronic otitis media, okay? Now, uh, acute mastoiditis, uh, how the ac acute mastoiditis occurs? <clears throat> um, what happens is whenever there's the inflammatory changes in the middle ear cleft, there is this um, aditus that connects the mastoid antrum to the middle ear. Okay, now during inflammatory process, there will be uh, inflammatory changes along the mucosa of the aditus also. So that will lead to um, blockage of the drainage of the mastoid antrum to the middle ear. Okay, so the inflammatory process will um, involve all the pneumatized uh, air cells around the mastoid antrum. That is that is that is known as acute osteitis, cause uh, which will cause bony destruction of mastoid air cell trabecula, often referred to as. Um, uh, coalescent mastoiditis. Okay, so um, there will be destruction, pneumatization of the um, mastoid air cells. Okay. Uh, the feature of acute mastoiditis is very important or otalgia with post order pain and fever. Okay, now. Other features like otorrhea and hearing loss. These are also um, the common presentation, but it is mostly seen in um, acute mastoiditis due to um, chronic uh, chronic otitis media. Okay, common sign will be post auricular swelling and 
pain in the ear and stomach cells okay along with fever so because of the um, sometimes what can also happen is there can be rupture of the pus collection from the mastoid cavity into the subperiosteal abscess um, that is space between the bone and the periosteum in the mastoid that will again cause very big bulge in the post oral abscess i'll show you the picture um, in the following slide and that will cause protrusion of pinna post auricular erythema and swelling which is the classical finding for acute nephritis and um, uh superior abscess Uh, this is a picture of right here, post oral area where the bulging seen at the post oral space, obliteration of the post oral and the pinna is directed downward and forward. So that that is the typical feature of acute mastitis. Okay, now. <clears throat> uh what can happen when there is a big abscess formation in the mastoid antrum? See, the mastoid antrum is among the biggest uh, cell in in mastoid air cell system. Now, whenever there is inflammatory change in this system, all of the or, uh, um, air cells around the mastoid antrum, not only antrum, all the other cells might get involved. Okay, so if that happens, then there is there are the mastoid air cells around the mastoid tip also. Okay, so in when there is a involvement of the mastoid tip cells, there can be osteitis of those air cells, leading to uh, uh, dissolve. Um, um, breakage of the, all the uh, separation partition of that air cells. Along with that, there will be pus that will try to drain from that mastoid antrum along the um, sternocleidomastoid, uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle that is attached to the mastoid tip. If that happens, then the, that abscess is known as Basal's abscess. Okay, and so, uh, same so abscess might again. Uh, <clears throat> uh, drain somewhere else, like in the posterior part of the occiput, that is uh, again possible, and not in not only into the um, extra temporal space, it can again um, be coexist with uh, intracranial complication like cerebellitis or cerebral abscess, meningitis or lateral sinus thromophlebitis, and um, along with that, facial nerve palsy can also occur. As you know, facial nerve um, course is inside the mastoid bone. So whenever there is a mastoid infection, facial nerve palsy can occur very easily. Okay. Now, how do you diagnose the case? The case is easily diagnosed clinically, but we have to do the CT scan of the temporal bone to see the spread of the disease and how complicated to find the coexisting or with acute mastoiditis. Okay. Now, how do you manage this case of mastoiditis? See, if the mastoiditis is due to acute otitis media, then simply you have to, you can simply, if there's a subperiosteal abscess, you have to drain the abscess and um, give early antibiotics. Along with that, you can simply do myotomy uh, with or without by a ventilation tube that is grommet. Otherwise, if it is due to cholesteatoma, the first treatment will be only surgical treatment will help that condition, and that surgery is mastoidectomy. Okay, there are different types of mastoidectomy done, but if it is due to cholesteatoma, you always have to go for modified radical mastoidectomy with IV antibiotics. Okay, at least for two weeks. Another one is facial nerve paralysis. It is again the commonest complication that can occur due to otitis media. If again, if it is due to acute otitis media, then the <clears throat> um, you always have to think of uh, bony defect that is or, or, or that can be present as a congenital or due to inflammatory changes of acute otitis media. Okay. Now, um, facial nerve palsy occurring within the first 10 days of acute otitis media is caused by edema of the nerve 
that is within the fallopian canal. It is essentially a neuropraxia or recovery can be achieved by systemic antibiotics while field myotomy to release the pus that is under tension inside the middle ear cleft uh, with or without grommet uh, tube. Now, simple mastectomy is recommended for um, rec recalcitrant cases or recurrent cases or sometimes along for um, uh, first cases also. Now, if facial nerve palsy is due to chronic otitis media, again, the treatment method is again different. That is, again, you have to go for modified radical mastoidectomy. Okay, now, um, Whenever the complication is there, you always have, have to find whether it is due to acute otitis media or chronic otitis media. And the treatment depends upon the cause of the compl complication. Okay. Now, when you do modified radical mastoidectomy for facial nerve paralysis with uh, due to cholesteatoma, facial nerves should be explored from the first genu to the stylomastoid foramen. Okay, that is known as decompression of the facial nerve. Okay, and <clears throat> uh, that will um, uh, help improve the um, palsy due to uh, cholesteatoma. Sometimes, if there's a descent of the nerve trunk, then repair should be performed using a nerve graft or nerve rerouting or end-to-end -end anastomosis has to be done. Sometimes, facial nerve palsy can occur during modified radical mastoidectomy. So, you have to find out whether it is due to small inflammatory changes around the nerve or either due to defect um, due to disease. If there's a long gap, then you always have, it is best treatment is to repair the uh, nerve uh, by uh, grafting. Another one is acute petrocytis. So there are different parts of the temporal bone. Okay. One of the parts is petrous. Petrous bone that is like a rich um, reach of the bone. Whenever you see the, you have all of you have been into the anatomy class, and all of you have seen the base of the skull, right? So uh, you must remember there is. You might remember there is a bony ridge there inside the base of the skull, right? So that is the petrous part of the temporal bone, and petrocytis is an inflammation of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, and is usually uncommon. Yes. Now, diagnosis of petrocytis uh, is reserved for infected petrous cells with inadequate drainage causing bone changes of coalescence in the cells, cell walls and resulting in symptoms referable to petrosa. The important trial that is seen in this petrocytis is known as Gradinigo syndrome, where Gradinigo syndrome, okay, so you should know what is Gradinigo syndrome. Gradinigo syndrome is seen in petrocytis, which is, which includes deep-seated eye pain, persistent ear discharge, and uh, facial pain. Now, um, see, retro, retro bulbar pain, diplopia, and persistent opia, that is known as gradual syndrome. Why there is um, retro bulbar pain in, and diplopia in case of gradual syndrome? As you go through the anatomy in the base of the skull, you, you, um, you will find two important nerves, that is fifth nerve and the sixth nerve in the um, Apex region. Okay, so irritation to that fifth nerve that will cause retrobulbar pain, and diplopia is due to sixth nerve paralysis that is seen nearby. Okay, and along with that, there will be persistent otoria. So this is very important syndrome that is seen in petrocytis, and you will frequently be asked about this. Okay. Um, sometimes there might be transient facial paralysis and mild recurrent vertigo or fever. Okay, now for 
every for every each and every case of complication whenever there is a complication the first investigation of choice should be ct scan of the temporal bone along with screening of the brain okay not uh, so that you will not skip all the intracranial complications okay and so HRCT temporal bone is confirmatory with uh, GAN67 or technetium 99 bone scan, okay, which will show the in, uh, high optic. Now, how do you manage a case of petrocytis? First and foremost, it is there is there should be antibiotic coverage and then surgical drainage. So the determining factors for drainage roots are location of the infection, pneumatization of the temporal bone, and the status of the hearing. And in the absence of hearing, the translabyrinthine approach gives excellent exposure to the posterior portion of the petrous apex. Okay, if anterior drainage is necessary in the patient with hearing, subtemporal or infracochlear approach is best. Now, if there is a posterior apicitis, then it can be approached by retrolabyrinthine or subarcuate route. Okay, so all these routes are not so important. First and important one is you will have to find if it is due to acute otitis media or CS, uh, chronic otitis media. If it is due to chronic otitis media, then um, on top, not only drainage, you also have to clear the mastoid of all the cholesteatoma. Okay, so that is modified radical mastoidectomy with drainage of the abscess in the petrus. Okay, so both provide adequate access in the well pneumatized bone. That means all these roots, as well as allow both hearing preservation and the drainage. So this is about retrolabyrinthine and subarcuate root that is done for um, patient with uh, um, good hearing. Now another complication is labyrinthitis. It is the most frequent intratemporal complication uh, of otitis media. Okay. First is um, mastoiditis, then labyrinthitis. Okay, now pathogenesis. Um, <clears throat> again, um, the root is acute um, in acute condition. Middle ear suppuration may extend to the labyrinth via round window or preform fissula in the labyrinth from middle ear. Okay, in chronic. Uh, otitis media, there might be bony erosion by the disease itself, that is cholesteatoma uh, and osteitis and leading to um, destruction to the inner ear. Okay, If the inflammatory changes is induced in the labyrinth by transgression, then um, so certain uh, there can be different forms of labyrinth, labyrinthitis that can occur. First one is serous, then suppurative. Okay, so serous labyrinthitis is if you see the patient at the stage of serous labyrinthitis, then hearing and um, disease in the labyrinth can be reversible. But if it has turned into the serous to the suppurative labyrinthitis, then there is very less chance that the inflammatory process in the inner ear is reversible. So it will destroy cochlea, vestibule, and uh, there can be a dead ear. Okay, so um, this is very important. So, so vestibular irritation by inflammatory disease close to endosteum of bony labyrinth has been termed as perilabyrinthitis. Okay. Now, sometimes infection from this labyrinth can go to uh, in, um, intracranial cavity through um, cochlear or vestibular aqueducts, and um, sometimes it may be blood borne. Okay. So, what are the different features of labyrinthitis? As you know, labyrinth is the a uh, important um, organ for balance balance of our body. Yes. So um, <clears throat> uh, if there is labyrinthitis, there will be prostating vertigo and vomiting. And if it has involved both the cochlea, uh, then uh, there will be severe hearing loss that is due to 
uh, infection um, that is due to involvement of the nerve, eighth nerve. Yes, so sensory neural hearing loss will be there. Now, patient will be very much like immobile on the side with infected labyrinth upwards, avoiding any head movement. Okay, initially, there is a spontaneous, irritative, jerky nystagmus with quick component towards the affected ear, soon replaced by par paralytic jerk nystagmus towards the healthy side. Okay, in early stage, test of cochlear function indicate detained hearing, but with transition to suppressive stage, there is loss of cochlear function. So uh, as soon as you suspect of labyrinthitis, first thing is you'll admit the patient and start IV antibiotics and if necessary, em emergency surgical exploration is necessary to decrease the uh, infection load. Okay, so that uh, serious labyrinthitis doesn't change into superative labyrinthitis. Okay. So the treatment is serious labyrinthitis is directed, uh, treatment is directed to the etiological factor. So again, treatment matter in acute cause, it is myelinotomy with IV antibiotics. If it is um, due to chronic disease, then mastoidectomy with disease and antibiotic. <clears throat> Most important treatment of labyrinthitis is close and continuous monitoring of symptoms of ex intracranial extension, okay, which might happen. Um, and broad spectrum antibiotics prevent spread of infection, uh, infection in evidence of intracranial spreads and uh, which will warrant the surgical labyrinthectomy. Okay, uh, so, uh, absolute bed rest so that there is a uh, patient, um, the disease is less, hydration, antibiotics, drugs, um, and required to be deferred till the acute symptom of suppressive labyrinthitis. Okay, so along with the future health. Now, another important complication can be uh, labyrinth and fistula. Now, it is commonly seen in chronic otitis media where there is a bony erosion, okay? Um, uh, so it is one of the complications of chronic otitis media occurring uh, around 10% of cases. Sometimes it might be very silent and sometimes uh, and present vertigo in case of chronic otitis media, uh, that is cholesteatoma. Fistula occurs most commonly at the lateral dome of uh, lateral semicircular canal. That is the most su superficial part of the semicircular canal uh, near that is nearest to the mastoid antrum. Now, the state of hearing is apparently uh, in the apparently healthy ear bears heavily on the treatment decision. Okay, that means if uh, if the hearing is uh, gone, then you can simply do labyrinthectomy. Otherwise, um, how do you detect a case of uh, labyrinth in fistula? First thing is you have to simply go for a fistula test that is done either using seagull speckum or by pressing over the tragus. What you do is you create a positive pressure inside the uh, middle layer that if the fistula is there and if the positive pressure is uh, created in the middle layer through any route, then um, positive pressure will get transmitted into the inner ear, the patient will feel dizziness, which can again be seen by nystagmus. Pressing over the tragus or um, uh, and or uh, by pneumatic of air in the external ear by seagull speculum. Okay. Uh, in lat if the lateral semicircular canal is involved, then the nystagmus is horizontal. If the posterior semicircular canal is involved, then there is the vertical nystagmus. Okay, with large far anterior fistula, which was a simultaneously the ampulla of the horizontal and superior semicircular canal, the nystagmus is rotatory. Okay? Now there is a condition known as phenomena where there is a Rotico experienced by a patient with blind fistula and exposure to loud sound. Okay. Um, now, 
Uh, another one is false positive fistulation, uh, also known as Hannibal sign, which can be seen in syphilis due to um, hypermobile stapes foot plate um, and um, in patient fistula. Uh, which is due to syphilis. Okay, in false negative fistula sign are seen in dead labyrinth, in cholesteatoma, covering fistula, and in the of speculum of the uh, meatus. Okay, so this is all temporal complication of the um, uh, Okay, so as I talked before, um, other abscesses that is related with uh, mastoiditis, that is basal's abscess, um, which can present as a swelling along with the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. These are also among the extracranial complication. Okay. So this is all about uh, complication, uh, intratemporal complication of uh, chronic otitis media. Okay, so this is a very important topic and I hope you go uh, through your textbook and read it thoroughly so that you'll get to know about all the intracranial and the extracranial complications. Okay, thank you class.